Our friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In our last episode, we looked at one of my favorite fighters during the Clone Wars period, the ARC-170, and broke down its many design flaws. Today, we continue with another popular Republic fighter design, the ETA Actus II. Created by Quad Systems Engineering, the ETA Actus II, along with the V-Wing, would serve as a template for future Imperial designs, specifically for the Senior Fleet Systems TIE Fighter in space superiority craft. Compared to its successor, the ETA-2 Actus was a pretty well-equipped starfighter which served as a bridge between Old Republic and Galactic Empire designs. The Republic prior to the Clone Wars had drawn on civilian soldiers, which meant that they put an emphasis on pilot survivability and safety. The Galactic Empire had an opposite philosophy, which started growing during the latter years of the Republic, as Chancellor Palpatine, who turned into the Emperor, started stripping away the last remaining traces of the Republic. I love democracy. Everything and everyone in the Empire was designed to serve the Emperor and his ambitions. And the TIE Fighter's poor and minimalistic design, which put little emphasis on pilot survivability, was an example of that. So the ETA Actus II is very much Palpatine and the Empire's first step towards a more minimalistic design. Today we're going to be breaking down this craft and looking at its flaws. The ETA Actus II was primarily designed to replace the Jedi Fighter, otherwise known as the Delta VII Aether Sprite. This was a very minimalistic craft designed specifically with the Jedi in mind. As a matter of fact, many essential systems and scanners were removed from the craft to save weight. What resulted was an extremely maneuverable and stripped down starfighter that was difficult to punt for individuals without the force. The ETA Actus II built on this design and was even faster and more nimble than the Delta VII. The ETA Actus II was designed alongside the V-Wing and the ARC-170. The latter two designs were created for widespread use amongst the clone pilots. But because the ETA Actus II performed quite well in the hands of the Jedis, and more importantly because it was so small, 192 of these fighters would be equipped on each Venator class Star Destroyer. Now, the ETA Actus II clone trooper variant usually didn't have astromechs and were less stripped down versions than the Jedi ones. But because this craft was designed for Jedi pilots, meant the clone troopers couldn't utilize this craft to its fullest potential. One of the major steps backwards that the ETA Actus II took from the Aether Sprite design was that it lacked shields. As a matter of fact, a lot of Jedi pilots protested against the manufacturers for this exact reason. Although I can't prove it, I wouldn't be surprised if ultimately Palpatine was responsible for this design choice to increase Jedi casualties and make them easier to kill during Order 66. Some modified ETA Actus II craft would incorporate shields later on, but more or less, this design would stay in place without proper defenses. When Sinyar Fleet Systems designed the TIE Fighter, it would incorporate the ETA Actus II's lack of shields, claiming that speed and maneuverability was better than being slow and protected. But the real reason they did this was more likely because it significantly decreased production costs and energy requirements. Interestingly enough, the other ship the TIE Fighter was based on, the V-Wing, did have shields. But ultimately, the design that Sinyar Fleet Systems would incorporate from that ship was also one of its flaws, a lack of life support systems. Which I'm sure they explained by saying less air meant tougher pilots, but in reality this was also another cost reduction measure. While speed and maneuverability did keep pilots alive in large scale space battles, even the best Jedi pilots couldn't account for shrapnel, stray laser fire, or even space debris and micrometeorites. Not having shields wouldn't have been as big of a deal if the ETA Actus II was heavily armored like, say, the ARC-170. The ARC-170 could actually shrug off a couple of laser blasts after its shields went down, and many of these resilient fighters made it back to the hangar with a few battle scars. The ETA Actus II was not only unshielded, but also extremely lightly armored. This meant the pilot actually had a very small margin for error. This is why, again, the ETA Actus II was really more suited for Jedi pilots rather than clones. Now, the Separatist Alliance had a variety of missiles at their disposal, but perhaps no other weapon in the Separatist Alliance arsenal was more feared by Republic pilots than the Buzz Droid missile. These weapons deployed a cluster of tiny droids which clamped onto enemy starfighters and quickly using cutting tools to dismantle their hull and essential systems. This oftentimes led to the ship being disabled, or even worse, the cockpit venting into space or the ship just exploding. 
There are very few defenses against buzz droids, but the ETA Actus II was extremely vulnerable to these droids, not only because of their light armor, but because the radiator and foils on the wings were virtually uncovered to allow better thermal radiation. And because of the widespread of the buzz droid canisters, it was almost impossible to avoid them. So even talented pilots like Anakin and Obi-Wan Kenobi couldn't avoid getting caught in their range. Watching and learning, Battle One. Uh oh. Uh -oh. That's not good. One of the major reasons why the ETA Actus II was lighter and smaller than the Delta VII Aether Spire was because the front hole of the former design was removed, giving the ETA Actus II a split bow design. This left the front of the canopy unshielded from collisions from space debris and enemy fire. It also significantly weakened the structure of the ship. The Aether Sprite's triangular design was able to withstand much more pressure and stress. Now, one advantage the ETA Actus II did have over the Aether Sprite was that it had a full astromech socket. The Delta VII fuselage was way too thin and only special astromechs could work in its slot. It basically had one of those annoying micro USB ports instead of a full USB port. Now, one of the main reasons you would have an astromech on board was for calculating hyperspace jumps. But despite having an astromech droid built on board, the ETA Actus II was too small to incorporate a hyperdrive limiting its range significantly. Which is probably why the ARC-170, one of the few Republic starfighters large enough to have a hyperdrive, was designed for a recon role, despite being poorly suited for the job. Because the ETA Actus II, the V-Wing, and the Torrent fighters all didn't have hyperdrives, it meant that the majority of the Venator-class Star Destroyers, 400 plus starfighters, didn't have hyperspace capabilities. This severely limited the Venator's ability to carry out long-range offensive attacks, and because it lacked close-range firepower like later Star Destroyers would have, this was a huge problem. In order to allow starfighters to travel in hyperspace, the Venator-class Star Destroyer deployed a series of hyperspace rings. The ETA Actus II, when paired with the Silear 45 hyperspace drive, was rated as a Class 1.0 hyperdrive-capable vehicle, which was actually quite fast at the time. The problem was deploying the rings and storing them in the middle of combat was a complicated issue and just wasn't practical. The hyperspace rings would be discarded after use serving as a very easy target for the enemy, so usually squadrons had to assign fighters to defend these rings so the ETA Actus II had a way to get back home. The ETA Actus II had two laser cannons, but no concussion or proton torpedo launchers. This significantly limited the craft's ability to serve in an anti-capital ship role. Due to the Venator-class Star Destroyer's lack of turbo lasers, it depended on the smaller craft for more firepower. Without heavier weapons, the ETA Actus II had to get pretty creative in order to damage larger capital ships. Oh, I have a bad feeling about this. Most ETA-2 act as pilots were just limited to chasing enemy starfighters. In place of proton torpedoes, the ETA Actus II had ion cannons for a secondary firing mode. The ion cannons were good for peacekeepers because they could disable civilian ships temporarily without destroying them. In combat, hitting the enemy with laser cannons was preferable. Although ion cannons were pretty useful against droids, they only deactivated them, while lasers permanently destroyed droids and didn't give them a chance to reboot. Also, ion cannons were widely inaccurate, especially at further ranges, and the smaller ion cannons like the ones on the ETA Actus were ineffective against larger capital ship shields. You'd need something significantly more powerful like an ion torpedo to damage a larger craft. Despite its minimal systems, the ETA Actus II still generated a considerable amount of thermal energy, which needed to be dispersed from the craft system in order to prevent it from overheating and getting permanently damaged. The s foils on the ETA Actus II were put on the tips of the wings, which was the optimal location for heat dispersion away from the center of the craft. The problem was even though the entire wing was basically a heat sink, the surface area was still too small to properly get rid of enough heat. It's the same problem smaller and thinner gaming laptops face, and one of the limiting factors in technology design in our own world. Smaller devices means less area to dissipate heat, which is why the latter TIE Fighter design would feature gigantic S-foils which were larger than the body of the craft. The Bell of Corsine would ultimately determine the future in Starfighter design. 
During the battle, the heavier and fully equipped ARC-170 suffered extremely high casualties when compared to the ETA Actus II. This would lead the Republic and ultimately Imperial designers to favor the more agile and less armored TIE fighter design over something more well-rounded like the X-Wing. But I would argue the failures of the ARC-170 was due to that craft's specific design flaws, which we talked about in another video, you can check that out right here. And it was also due to the extremely small and agile enemy droid fighters it faced, rather than the ETA Actus II's superior design. Although the ETA Actus II performed better than the ARC-170 did against the droid fighters, it doesn't necessarily mean that unshielded starfighters are better than shielded ones. Unfortunately, Empire believed in this philosophy and chose wrong. Ultimately, the X-Wing, which in many ways was a lighter version of the ARC-170, would outperform the minimalistic TIE Fighter, which was the successor for the ETA Actus II. Well guys, that is our breakdown for the ETA Actus II. Let me know what you think in the comment section below about this craft. Also, don't forget to check out the rest of our 10 Flaws series. I think we have like almost 13 or 14 videos now, so we'll link that in a playlist right around here. Also, guys, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on future episodes. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.